Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and delegates from African neighboring countries, China, and beyond. Good morning, Dumelang, Absheni, Sanibonani, Huyomora, Dimachirani, Molweni, Nihao. My, <laughs> My name is Bongiwe Tutu, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this South Africa-China Dialogue on the Belt and Road Initiative. We appreciate your strong commitment to be here today. It's a tremendous task we set ourselves to compete against Black Friday. <laughs> For some of us, it was a matter of a coin toss, and I called it tails, and that's why I'm standing here today. But it's a great honor to have a full room today. Thank you all. Um, I think let's see, firstly, by a show of hands, why some of you are here today. How many of you are here because you are experts on the Belt and Road Initiative? Okay. And how many of you are here because you want to know more on the Belt and Road Initiative? And how many of you are here today because you know nothing at all about the Belt and Road Initiative? <laughs> well, that's, those are very interesting indications, and I will explain later in my closing why I asked for those. But I can say um, with sheer confidence that your indications will be enlightened in this Belt and Road Initiative conference. And now to introducing our honorable speakers. Professor Adam Habib, Wits University Vice Chancellor and Principal. His Excellency Ambassador Lin Song Chiang, Chinese Ambassador in South Africa. Dr. Funega Yazini April, Senior Research Specialist at the Human Science Research Council. Professor Fang Dershang, International Business School at the Beijing Foreign Studies University. <laughs> Professor Liu Haifang at the Center of African Studies at the School of International Studies at the Peking University. <laughs> Dr. Bob Wegesa, Coordinator of the Mid-Career Honors Program at Wits University's Journalism Department. Suppose he's not here yet. And Professor Garth Shelton of the Department of International Relations at Wits University. <laughs> Did I mention? <laughs> His Excellency Ambassador Dr. Manili Sikenge, um, Chief Director of East Asia and Oceania at the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, we embrace you to this renowned institution, internationally recognized for its strong commitment to research, academic excellence, and development. With resilient global partners, networks, and relationships rooted over decades to date, Wits University continues to groom instruments of impacting meaningful change and growth in society, unfolding masters for generations to come. Wits University being well placed in Johannesburg, the connecting pin of South Africa, is at the core of the research, teaching, training, and implementation developments of the Belt and Road Initiative to South Africa. With China as South Africa's biggest trading partner and South Africa having the largest Chinese community, discussions on the Belt and Road Initiative to South Africa are imperative, particularly in light of South Africa's pivotal objective of addressing the country's triple challenge of poverty, inequality, and unemployment, and in its pursuit for economic transformation. 
this Belt and Road Conference provides an opportunity to converse with Chinese perspectives on the Belt and Road Initiative and is part of an ongoing engagement by Wits University to unload the Belt and Road Initiative. And so we are very honored to have global members from the media, researchers, think tanks, government, and the public to engage directly with African and Chinese experts on the Belt and Road Initiative and to consider South Africa's potential participation in the Belt and Road Initiative. The conference consists of two sessions. The first session presents the keynote panel on South Africa and the Belt and Road Initiative and it will be chaired by Elizabeth Sideropoulos from the South African Institute of International Affairs. Session two will be chaired by Professor Philip Harrison from the Witt School of Architecture and Planning, and that session will be looking at the perspectives on the Belt and Road Initiative. Before I lead for the opening by our Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Adam Habib, I would like to go over some announcements. We don't expect you to switch your cell phones off, but to please rather put them on silent so as to not interrupt the convenience. And we encourage you to stay connected using the Wi-Fi details, which should be provided by our student assistants. And should you be tweeting or sharing this conference on social media, then let's trend with the hashtag BRI. The restrooms are on the right of the exit of this hall, straight ahead through the dining area. The media room is on the right of the exit of this hall, straight through the dining area and through the door on the right of it. The VIP room is on the right of, is, is right through the exit of this hall, through the door on the right of the dining area, further down the corridor. And should you need any further assistance, please see the student's assistants um, who will be running around the venue. And now, let me introduce you to Professor Adam Habib, Wits University's Vice Chancellor and Principal, who is also the Chair of the University of South Africa, which represents Vice Chancellors and higher education in the country. He is a Professor of Political Science. Habib has over 30 years of academic research and administrative expertise, spanning five universities and multiple local and international institutions boards and task teams. His professional involvement in institutions has always been defined by three distinct engagements, the contest of ideas, the translation into actionable initiatives, and the building of institutions. Prior to joining WITS, Habib was instrumental in transforming the University of Johannesburg following nationwide mergers of tertiary institutions in 2005 and played a key role in increasing research output under his then role of Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation, Library, and Faculty Coordination. Habib has served several academic and research posts at the University of Natal, including professor in the School of Development Studies and research director of the Center for Civil Society. He has also focused on building African research excellence, and together with the University of Cape Town, WITS initiated the African Research Universities Alliance, ARUA. Professor Habib, over to you. So thank you, Bagibe. It's a real pleasure to be here, Ambassador Lindy. It's lovely uh, seeing you again, Ambassador Genge. Uh, we go back a long way, so it's lovely hosting you back at, at Wits University. Colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Wits University. Uh, my purpose is to actually uh, introduce this conference and welcome you all of, uh, to Wits University. I will say uh, a few quick remarks about Wits University. Bangui's already said some of it. Uh, it's a very special institution. It was the place, I often argue, where Nelson Mandela walked its corridors. It's the place where Robert Sabukwe uh, taught its students in the 1950s. Uh, it is a place at the center of Johannesburg which constitutes something like 30% uh, of the national economy. Um, 
It's a, a place that e effectively emerged at the dawn of Johannesburg uh, as a school to service the mining industry. And over the last 100 years, or about 100 years, has become effectively uh, woven in the inner fabric uh, of, of, of South Africa at what, at what it stands for. In a lot of ways, I often say, Ambassador Lynn, that Wits University produces the most billionaires on the African continent. But then I'm reminded by all of the activists we have that not only do we produce the most billionaires on the African continent, we also produce most of the activists who fight those billionaires uh, on the African continent. So it is an incredibly special place. Uh, it is, if you like, does a whole host of research from uh, the health sciences uh, to economics to developmental questions to issues of governance uh, to the hard sciences in mathematics uh, and, and physics and theoretical physics. And I see a number of colleagues from all of these departments here. Many of those uh, initiatives are in partnership uh, with institutions around the world and increasingly, Ambassador Lin, are in partnership with institutions in China. Uh, we've just come back from, I think about nine months ago, from a visit, a three-week visit to China, where we had taken a whole host of colleagues and went to Peking and the Beijing Institute of Technology and uh, Xinhua and Fudan and a whole host of, of universities in China to begin exploring potential partnerships in a multiplicity of fields. So uh, this partnership with China has begun a number of years ago. And with Ambassador Lin, we've begun to build this partnership so that our institutional relationships strengthen in this particular uh, world uh, that we're living in now. I do want to say, however, that this conference is about the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, it's important to say, I think, a few important words in this regard. Much of the deliberations around uh, understanding what the Belt and Road Initiative stands for, uh, the critical reflections in it, will be undertaken by my colleagues in the coming uh, two sessions. But I nevertheless want to make a few remarks because I think it's absolutely important from a university perspective to frame where I think this conversation should go and where I think our relationship should go. The Belt and Road Initiative, in a sense, is an ambitious program of public investment by China. And it is particularly uh, arose out of the extraordinary economic success of China since the late 1970s, the early 1980s. And what is interesting about the Belt and Road Initiative is that it's focused on outbound investment from China. It's basically China's face to the world. China has developed itself to an astonishing extent in the last 30 years. And what now China is saying is we want to take some of those resources, some of those uh, lessons, and deploy it to the rest of the world. We want to partner. We want to engage. We want to start thinking through how we bring those resources and focus them in, in enabling some of the uh, fundamental transformations we've achieved in China for the rest of the world. Much of this, if you like, is focused on uh, a broad infrastructure on ports and railway lines and gas pipelines and bridges and ICT in the contemporary world. Now, I think that is important, by the way. It's not on financial speculation. It's not on moving money from one part of the system to another. It's about putting real things on the ground. And whatever happens in the finances side, if the stuff is in the ground, if the stuff is there and connecting people, your world changes. You see, your world never changes by making money run around. What your world changes is if you build institutions, and through those institutions, you connect human beings. 
then it is the connection of the human beings. It is those institutions that leave the legacy of fundamental change. And in that sense, I think that the Belt and Road Initiative is an important one. There are, of course, a whole series of criticisms that are emerging around the world, around China's emergence in the world. There's a lot of people uh, who've expressed disquiet about the challenges of China in the world, and that China is trying to advance its agenda. And my answer to that is, why shouldn't be China trying to advance its agenda? It's logical that if you're going to put hundreds of billions of dollars out into the world, that you have foreign policy obligations and interests. I'm not surprised by that. In fact, everybody who puts this kind of money and resources, and even a whole range of people who don't put this kind of money and resources, all have this kind of agenda. We have this agenda as South Africans. Many African institutions have it. The US has it. Western Europe has it. So if China is having it in the Belt and Road Initiative, why are we surprised? The fundamental question for us is, can there be a coincidence of interest between China's agenda and Africa's agenda? Because if we can make that coincidence of interest, then the possibilities of transforming our world then begins to emerge. And it seems to me that that's the first part that we say. The second, as somebody who works, who has worked at least, Elizabeth, for a period of time in the field of international relations, I can tell you that when we have a single sole superpower in the world, the developing world always loses out. That if you want to look at the history of development in the South, if you want to look at the history of development in Southeast Asia, or the history of development in Africa, or the history of development in Latin America, or even in Western Europe, those developmental agendas emerged in a global context of dual or multipolar powers. You very rarely have developmental agendas that developed in the South in the context of a unipolar world. A bipolar, and even better, a multipolar world enables the possibilities for development because countries of the South then have multiple options. They have multiple options to engage in the world order. They have multiple options to draw resources from the world order. And to be honest, they then can ensure that the, en the engagements they have with, sup with big powers occurs on terms that are compatible with their own developmental enterprises. For a long period of time, in the 1980s, many of my colleagues here will know this, that our engagements with parts of the West led to very destructive conditionalities, structural, co structural demands uh, from the IMF and World Bank in the 1980s decimated higher education on the African continent. Much of the concerns, much of the tragedies of higher education in Africa today in part lies from the failures of Western engagement in Africa and its structural conditionalities of the 1980s. So when we're looking forward, when we're beginning to engage with Belt and Road, we must start beginning to say, what are the terms? On what conditions? And how do we make sure that those terms and structural co and conditions work with and are compatible with the developmental objectives of South Africa, Ambassador Genge, but also the rest of the continent itself? So in a sense, when people say China has an agenda when it, when it engages in Belt and Road, my answer is yes, it does. And absolutely it should. What I want to ensure, as a South African and as an African, is to ensure that I can create the coincidence of interests so that their interests and our interests are not contradictory, so that their interests and our interests can enable the development of this country and this continent, so that their interests and our interests can enable the development and linking up of this continent 
to enhance our, enhance our uh, African position in the global economy itself. I want to say also that we live in a dangerous world. Wherever you look, all across the world, you will see that the forces of the right are on the rise. They're on the rise in South Africa, but they're on the rise in the United States. You've seen them on the rise in Western Europe. You've seen them on the rise in Asia. In a world where the right wing is trying to separate people, where they're trying to divide us from one another, it is fundamentally important that we start building institutional linkages. I just want to quickly end by saying, I think what is two important things. We should not be surprised that China has distinctive interests in the Belt and Road Initiative. It is important for China to have that. What we need to ensure as Africans is that China's interests coincide, coincide with our interests, that we can create a compatibility between their agenda and ours. And a multipolar world always enables countries in the developing world to be able to get terms and conditions for finance and infrastructural development that is in their interests. And for that particular reason, it's important that this Belt and Road Initiative is, is taken seriously. As uh, Bongiwe asked earlier on, why is it, how many, why are so many people here? And many of the hands that went up suggested that people want to know more about the Belt and Road Initiative. It's an initiative that's worth at least, Ambassador Lynn, more than $100 billion, something close to $130 billion. And so in a sense, it isn't surprising that such a large degree of people actually want to know that, that there are countries around the world and initiatives around the world that want to become part of this initiative. By May 2017, we had 68 countries had signed up in one form or the other with the Belt and Road Initiative. And it seems to me that South Africa should, and the rest of the continent, should be exploring a particular relationship and partnership in this regard. Here's how, what we do need to do, however. If we are going to be partnering with China in the Belt and Road Initiative and in the others, through the BRICS Forum and FOCAC and the other arrangements, then it's absolutely fundamental that three things are known. One is exactly the terms, or exactly the scale of the Belt and Road Initiative, the kinds of projects that it's financed, what's worked and what hasn't. That's the first fundamental question. The second we need to understand is the terms of those kinds of arrangements. What is the terms of the partnership that is emerging and how can we make sure that that partnership is structured in a form that enables inclusive development in South Africa but in the rest of the continent. And third and most importantly, it seems to me, we need to learn from the practices that, that we have. We need to learn around the implementation. One of the great saddest things about South Africa since 1994 is not that we have great policies. We have some of the best policies in the world. We've got to figure out how to implement, and we've got to figure out how to implement on scale. Now, if anybody's traveled to China recently and traveled over the last 20 years to China and went to Shanghai or went to Beijing, you'll understand one thing that the Chinese have actually mastered is implementing on scale. And it seems to me that that's what we also got to understand. So for me, yes, we should be engaging the Belt and Road Initiative. We do need to understand its substantive programs, its scale, the amount of resources and where it wants to fund. We need to start thinking through the terms and we need to understand the implementation of it. And then finally, we need to monitor its initiatives over the next period of years. We need to understand the kinds of initiatives it's undertaking, what's working, what's not, with what consequences, and how do we learn from, from those experiences for new projects. And it seems to me that that's the fundamental purpose of this conference. It's to bring together stakeholders from the universities, from business, from labor, 
from the political parties, from governments itself, to have, if you like, a critical reflection on Belt and Road initiatives, on the kinds of programs that are being funded, on the kinds of effects that it has, on a critical look at the inclusive benefits that are emerging, and then seeing whether we could use this and other resources that are emerging in the global, in the global community to begin to create an inclusive developmental agenda. An inclusive developmental agenda is fundamentally important to building bridges amongst human beings in our world. And it's important to build those bridges so that we cohere as a collective human community. Because the last 30, 10, 20 years has seen the human community fracture. And if we don't learn to come together, we can't learn to address the transnational challenges of our time, whether they're terrorism or structural inequality or climate change or renewable energy or public health. If we don't conquer those challenges, our species, our human species, will disappear in the next two to three hundred years. But to fix those problems, we fundamentally have to come together and cohere as a human community. And the Belt and Road Initiative can be one element in enabling, in enabling the human community around the world to become part of an inclusive agenda for change. And so that's what the purpose of this conference is. If you like, we pioneers in thinking through how to enable inclusive development. And so I want to welcome all of you to WITS University. I want to welcome Ambassador Lin and Ambassador Genge. And let's have a fruitful set of deliberations in the coming hours. Thank you very, very much. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Also from, from my side, um, I think uh, Bongibo introduced uh, me um, briefly um, earlier. Uh, I work at the South African Institute of International Affairs, which is on, on WITS campus and, and also uh, an alumna of WITS University, although not a billionaire, unfortunately. <laughs> not in my line of work, anyway. <laughs> Um, um, I think uh, uh, Professor Habib uh, 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 set out a number, I think, of very important points related to the Belt and Road, and I, I think the, the remarks right at the end uh, are ones that we should take forward into, into the subsequent sessions. I think significantly, in a world that is fractured uh, and fragmented, and increasingly so, and polarized, um, initiatives that seek to build bridges uh, both at a um, uh, at a people to people level and also in a physical way because that's what uh, what brings us together are absolutely vital uh, if we are going to uh, tackle some of the most significant global challenges that I think we as a human race have seen uh, over the last several uh, several thousand years. I think the Belt and Road Initiative has, it would be true to say, has really galvanized, the vision of it I think has galvanized uh, nations, communities, societies um, with its, I think both with its scale but also with what it promises. Um, in the context of South Africa of course and, and, and of the region, it creates enormous possibilities to address some of our significant socioeconomic challenges. Fundamental, uh, the f most fundamental of which, of course, is inclusive, inclusive growth, inclusive, uh, inclusive development. From the side of, of China, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, talk over the last several years around uh, China's soft power. And I think, if, if anything, the Belt and Road, I think, uh, represents and projects some of that soft power, uh, um, uh, an ideational uh, um, contribution uh, to, uh, to international relations and international cooperation. And I think it's, it's important to remember that it's actually international cooperation uh, that we need the most of uh, at, at this point in, in, in time. Um, I think it's, it's an initiative that has really taken off. It started in 2013 in Indonesia, the announcement around the maritime uh, belt, and in Central Asia, certainly along the, the terrestrial uh, belt, linking, uh, linking China to, through Central Asia to Europe. But I think it's become a global 
global vision uh, for bringing people together. Uh, it's an economic vision, uh, but it's also a, 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 a people to people and political vision. Uh, and it creates alternative uh, possibilities uh, for, for the developing world. And I think for that reason, uh, this is such an important uh, uh, discussion today in the South African context where we're also wanting to attract, attract uh, investment or to drive our economy to address inequality, unemployment and poverty and also in the broader context of Africa actually uh, uh, to, to see a much more developed uh, continent. And here one last point before I ask the ambassador to come and uh, uh, address you is, is, is the point about uh, that Adam made about the coincidence of interests. Everybody has interests and that's fine. Um, our responsibility as South Africans, our responsibility as Africans is to make sure that there is a coincidence of interests uh, and that we, our own agency, uh, uh, is reflected in the way in which we engage on, 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 uh, on, on the Belt and Road. And, and here I just want to mention that also some of the work that we've been doing at the Institute with, uh, with my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Van Staden, who will be speaking a little later, uh, uh, is organizing a, a, a workshop on the 3rd of December around the issue of, of African agency in China. And I think all of these, uh, uh, I, I think, add, um, add to the broader uh, ideas and, and, and debates that uh, we're going to have to be engaging with uh, certainly as academics, as, as business people, as, as labor, um, and, and, and so on. Uh, let me uh, call on the, His Excellency the Ambassador, uh, who I have always found to be a, a great uh, a communicator and great visionary also of how we bring China and, and South Africa and the, and the continent uh, together to give, us, uh, to give us his address. Ambassador. Thank you, Professor Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Yolmo, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of this great university, Professor Adam Habis, and also your Honorable, the Chairperson of National Parliament, he just came through from Cape, uh, Cape Town to join us. Thank you all so much, Mr. Florek. Uh, I met Your Excellency, I met Genge, the Chief Director of um, the DECO and the senior officials, Mr. Charles and a friend here uh, from the DECO. Government officials, uh, officials from government, uh, parties, political parties, parliaments, and also my friend, my uh, Ambassador of Singapore, thank you so much for to come to join us, and Diplomatic Corps, the friend from Diplomatic Corps, professors, uh, scholars, think tanks, media friends, business uh, leaders from both China and South Africa. Good morning. First of all, let me uh, thank the West University for hosting this brief uh, Bear and Road Initiative Conference where so many government and party officials, think tank expert business leaders and media friends can gather together to its changes on what is the Bear and Road Initiative. How is the Bear and Road Initiative going on? And how to signalize the Bear and Road Initiative with this continent, with this continent's development? I think it's the theme. The theme, the, the theme and agenda for this conference address timely the interest and concern of the international community is basically the African peoples. Because we're talking a lot, and some people scare us. The Bear and Row is a very big channel to the continent, to the African country, but I see His Excellency, the Vice Chancellor, share with us. The challenges from come to China, of course, but the challenge is come for good, better, or for worse. That we need to, un to discuss. And for us, we are ready to open ourselves to discuss what is it. It demonstrates the global perspective and strategic vision of the WIS University under the leadership of Vice Chancellor, Professor Adam Harbit. I look forward to very fruitful changes in this journey, this conference, to build consensus and wisdom to contribute to a better understanding 
the Bay and Road Initiative and better synergize, synergizing the Bay and Road Initiative with African development. Ladies and gentlemen, facing a profound change in world over the recent years, the way is changing. Some visionary leaders, strategists, strategists in the world, and all the people in the world are looking tirelessly with, for the correct answers to two fundamental issues. Very simple. Now the way it changed. Two questions we need to answer. We need to look for the correct answer to answer the two fundamental, fundamental issues in the world. Where for the world to go? First. Second, how to build a more beautiful and better world for the people to live? To answer these two major issues of our times, His Excellency President Xi Jinping of China put forward the Bear and Rule Initiative five years ago. Based on the Chinese history, the Bear and Rule from land and sea come to this continent and to the world. Based on the Chinese several practice of peaceful development, that's now, as His Excellency mentioned, and the practical need of China to open up for further development. We also need the world. And with a view to jointly build a more beautiful world and a better life for us all in the world. So drawing the wisdom from the Asian seal Rose spirit. The seed rose spirit, as somebody will share with us. The Bay and Row initiative put forward by his excellent President Xi Jinping. Advoc not complicated. Advocates for three together, for five connectivities. That means let us plan together, build together, and share together. For five connectivities. The connectivities of policy, connectivities of infrastructure, in connectivities of trade, connectivities of finance, connectivities of people. Five connectivities. If the policy is not favorable, don't worry, no one come. Why Singapore, UAE, Hong Kong get developed? They have the best location in the world, but every, everybody have the best location, don't worry. But why they get developed, the other country did not? Because of the favorable policy. The policy, favorable policy, only come from stable leadership. The policy is very important. Let us sit together to plan, to consult each other, to make, get ready the policy. When a policy, when you get developed, infrastructure is the key for any sustainable development. And if we want to develop, you have the production, you need market. That is a trade, unpitted, unimpeded trade for the corporation. And you need the investment and trade. You need financial con connectivities. No financial support, who will come here? When everybody come here to go, what we come here for? To get the people benefit, get the people involved, and benefit the people. So I think this five connectivities, let the advocates for five together, for five connectivities, for win-win cooperation, for common development. And that is to work together for a community of shared future for mankind. And that is the basic idea of the Bear and Road Initiative. Not very complicated. Let us work together for win-win cooperation for common development. So ladies and gentlemen, almost 2,000 years ago, the Chinese people are crossed, crossed from Asia to Europe, marking the beginning of Asian Silk Road by Kamal. You see, that is the merchant team from China. Over 600 years ago, during the Bin Dynasty, the great Chinese navigator called Zheng He, Zheng He led six voyages with an Unbeatable freight, unbeatable freight, at that time. At that time, the Chinese GDP accounted for 65% of the total world. So they built a very strong, unbeatable freight. The, the freight 
into the Pacific and crossed the Indian Ocean, reaching as far as eastern coast of eastern coast Africa on three expeditions. There is some uh, the people in the continent know understand very well. They reached three times to the uh, east coast of uh, Africa. And the Chinese, wherever it was over the land or across the sea, the Chinese people had brought pollen, a porcelain, tea, and silk products from China to oversee, while bringing back local products. It is through this Asian rule of friendly exchanges and mutual respect that we develop the shared rule spirit. What's the spirit of the shared and rule? A uh, uh, shared rule that means peace and cooperation, openness and inclusive, inclusiveness, and mutual lending, mutual benefit. That is the shared and rule spirit. Unlike the Western colonialists, I'm sorry to say, you know, sometimes they say China will follow them. I said, no, we will never do that because China never used the force to conquer, to bully anyone. At that time, we were, we were the strongest country in the world. But we never conquer, bully anyone, or occupy a single inch of land of any other countries. 600 years ago, China's GDP accounted for more than half of the world total. China achieved its development and got strong by our hard work of our people and peaceful cooperation and open development with the outside world, but never brought, never through. We got developed and got strong, never through the war or looting as some Western country did, as you know in the history. In the past 40 years, under the strong leadership of the Communist Party of China, China has remained, remained firmly committed to reform and open up to the outside world and peaceful development. By achieving an average annual growth rate of 9.5% for four decades continuously, China's GDP has increased by over 30 folds. The GDP is increased. Um, the per capita GDP increase has increased from 227 in 1978 to about 9,000 last year. China today is the world's second largest economy, the largest manufacturer of powers, the largest exporter of goods, the holder of the biggest foreign reserve, exchanges reserve, and more than that. The contribution from China to the world economic growth rate, to the economic growth, exceeds 30%, more than the contribution of all the developed countries combined. The contribution to drive the world economy in, since 2008, up to now, more than 30%, more than all the, develop, the contribution from all the developed countries put together. Over the years, 740 million Chinese people have been lifted out of poverty, creating a miracle in the history of the human development. Such a record you have never seen in the textbook in the history. So this is why the Western people do not understand they get a little confused because they get the idea and knowledge from the old textbook. But the practice and the successful practice in China, you did not have in your textbook. So this is why you don't understand. To uphold durable peace and re realize sustainable development in the world, serve the common interests of all countries and meet the common aspiration of all peoples and of course, it's the joint responsibility of all governments. The Chinese President Xi Jinping often says that only when the world is going well, China can get better. And that is our belief. If the world is going well, 
China will get better. When China get better, we contribute more to the world. The culture and philosophy is very important. He requests China to connect the Chinese dream of the great rejuvenation of Chinese nation closely with the dream of the world for a happy and better life, so as to build an open, inclusive, clean, and beautiful world that enjoys the lasting peace and universal security and common prosperity. This is I share the idea with the Vice Chancellor. How to coincide the interests of the people from the world? It is easy to see that the Bear and Road Initiative is an initiative with Chinese this distinct Chinese feature, but also bears the unique characteristic of our times. It has become the world's most popular international public goods and a most important platform for win-win cooperation. You like or not like, we are going. That is a most important platform for the win-win cooperation. If you like to share the win-win cooperation, you are free to join us. Of course, you're also free not to join us. The Bear and Road Initiative is completely different from the Western colonialism and the Marshall Plan. The Bear and Road focus, first, the Bear and Road focuses on economic development and does not engage in export or politics. It aims to address the bottleneck issue Let's restrain economic and social development by building five connectivities for common development. The Bay and Road does not export ideology, does not attach political strings, does not see politics of a small circle. The Bay and Road, in this, the second, the Bay and Road initiative is committed to open development and cooperation and resist protectionism. There's no geographical and ideological obstacles or barriers to participate in the Bear and Road initiative. Any country or region are welcome to join as long as they agree with and follow the principle of three together and committed themselves to build, to build in five connectivities. If we agree with and follow the principle and committed ourselves to work together for five connectivities, you are welcome to join us. In the Bear and Road Corporation, there's no coercion, no forced buying or sale, no trade protectionism, and certainly, no, there's no such things called China first or China only. The third, the Bear and Road Initiative see for win-win cooperation for common development and reject zero-sum gain. It's not a gain. No, you take more, I, let, I lose. No, the Bay and Road Initiative aims to join in effort to enlarge the cake to enlarge the case through the integrated economic, inter interconnected development, and share cooperation result, so as to achieve win-win development through complementing each other's comparative strengths instead of win, take it all. We're not coming here to play the game. The martial art plan was a product of Cold War and draw the line based on ideology and geopolitics, resulting in man-made conflict and division of the world into the West versus the East. It created conflict, conflict and division of the world into East and West, and let them fight. Cunt countries were grouped as either as ally or foe. If not the ally with them, you are the fault of them. The Bay and Road is open for all, regardless national strengths and social system. What is 
is joyful. It's to build a community of shared future for mankind by three together for five connectivities. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bay and Road Initiative begins with China, but being belongs to the whole world. Over the past five years, the Bay and Road Initiative has transformed from idea into actions, from vision into reality, producing visible and tangible results. Now, up to now, 113 countries plus 29 international organizations, put together 142 country, region, and international organizations, have signed the Bay and Road Initiative Corporation document with China. The Bay and Road Initiative has been written into UN resolution. From 2013 to 2017, China's import from the Bay and Road country, participating countries, has registered 6.97 trillion US dollars. Today, more than 10 China, Europe, free trade service run between China and Europe on a daily basis, greatly boosting trade across the region, Asia and, and Europe. In total, the train service has already completed over 10,000 trips to Europe, from China to Europe. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank proposed by China with 100 billion US dollars of capitalization is open to the world for infrastructure investment financing. The bank has approved investment for project worth over 5.3 billion US dollars since it started operation and has further driven over 30 billion US dollars of public and private investment into infrastructure development. Many countries have benefited from the foreign investment brought by this project through local job creation and tax revenue. The seed and the seed row fund with 40 billion US dollars established by China has already supported project totally 80 billion US dollars together. We are very happy to see that in Africa the African Union and 37 countries have already signed document on bear and road cooperation with China. The Addis Ababa to Djibouti Railway and the Bombasa to Nairobi Railway are all in full operation. This railway has effectively promoted corridor of fast industrial development. Ethiopia has achieved double-digit growth, GDP growth. I'm proud to say that's because of the rail from Addis to Djibouti. We opened the sea, opened the door for Ethiopia. That's because of the railway. But of course, the network of infrastructure follow to develop the corridor along the railway. So now, a lot of Chinese, including American, Japanese, American, Japanese, European investors rush to e Ethiopia. That's because of the railway we built, financed and built by China, I'm proud to say. We not build for China, not only build the railway for China and for Ethiopia, we build the railway, of course, for Ethiopia first, for African, for the world. In Kenya, the Mombasa Nairobi Railway has created nearly 50,000 jobs and contributed 1.5 annual GDP growth rate to that country. We believe this is a safer example of the new model or option for connecting the Bear Road, Road Initiative with African development. So ladies and gentlemen, in our views, Africa is a continent full of hope. It is blessed with rich nature and human resources and a nearly 1.3 population huge market. The 21st century is the century, not only for Asia, but also for Africa. A peaceful, stable, and prosperous Africa is not only in the fundamental interest of the world, but also the shared responsibility of international community. For Africa, if it is not independent economically, 
It is very hard for you to be independent politically, to achieve self sustainable development. Africa must break three development bottleneck. Africa, the resources are a lot. But why you cannot get developed? Because you lack of the capacity in two ways. One is infrastructure development, second is human resources development. So you only, in our views, whoever wants to get developed themselves, you have to break three bottlenecks before you get developed. That means bad work infrastructure, lack of professional and skilled personnel, and short of financial resources. I strongly believe whoever can truly help, truly help this continent, break these two, three bottlenecks to achieve the self sustainable development are the true friend and reliable partner of this continent. China and Africa have always been, uh, have always been a community with a shared future. We call ourselves as the, not only a friend and partner, but brother. Over the years, we have always respected each other as equal, stood together through sick and thin. His Excellency President, I have to mention, he is a great leader who is the only leader in the world, even in China, in our history, attached great importance in such a kind of extent importance to China-African relations. In the past five years, President Xi Jinping has made four state visits to this continent and has co-chaired two of the three focus summit. In history, we have only three China-African summit, but President Xi Jinping himself co-chaired chair two of them together with South African leaders. During the focus Beijing summit in September, President Xi Jinping whole held formal bilateral meeting with all 53 head of visiting delegation from this continent. No one, a Chinese, anyone else in the world. So many people rushed to Beijing for the summit, but my president, his excellent president Xi Jinping, opened held bilateral meeting with each of them. In 2015, President Xi Jinping proposed China African 10 major cooperation plan. And in 2018, he put forward, put forward new A, A major initiative together with 60 billion US dollars of financial support, respectively. This continent never lack of summit, never lack of document, never lack of plan, but have the plan plus together with US dollar, a Chinese follow China to do it. That's always the only aim to support Africa to break the three bottleneck to achieve industrialization and agricultural modernization. China-African cooperation has now entered a new era of win-win cooperation for common development. In this new era, guided by the three, the principle of three together, China is ready to work with Africa to synergize the Bear and Road Initiative with African development strategy for five connectivities for our common development. We, are, we will full, fully implement the A major initiative to support African countries to develop five network, five network of railway, highway, power grid, air transportation, and telecommunication to promote African industrialization, agricultural modernization, urbanization, and digitalization. Without such a network, railway, highway, power grid, air transportation, communication, can, how can we work together to meet, to welcome the fourth industrial revolution? The fourth industrial revolution has already come to us. It's not on the way to us. We need to get ready ourselves, and that is the network. We are ready to work with this continent under the framework of the One Bear, One Row initiative. Now to connect the Bear and Row initiative with Africa, facing two major challenges in my views. First, there's a lack of full understanding, or basic understanding of the Bear and Row in Africa. We do not know why it is. So uh, the, the Western media and think tank 
uh, or the petition, they give us a lot of the negative idea to scare us. So I'm very happy today we are here to open to each other to learn what is it. And what's the principle and concept of one bear, one row? And how to connect the bear and row with this continent and benefit from that? And that question we have to answer. The second, some people and country in the world don't like and are fearful. They are not only don't like, they are fearful to see China supporting African country to achieve independent economically and go independent completely politically as a result. They worry about, they like to keep this continent as it was. When you're poor, you are in poverty, you are in conflict. You have no choice but to bear from them. When you bear from them, they have a chance to give you interference. That is the, not difficult to understand. They worry about this continent to be independent economically as a result. They will never cease fabricating and playing up story of so-called Chinese new colonialism, debt trap, lack of investment, transparency, and so on. They create more. I'd like to answer the question, but truth will always prevail. We strongly believe the Afghan people are wise and mature enough to make your own and correct conclusion based on the fact. As a comprehensive strategic partner, both China and South Africa are playing a growing important role in our own region and maintain close cooperation across four major platforms, including focus, BRICS, Bay and Road, and South South Cooperation. China and South Africa relations supported by four platforms, that means focus, BRICS, One Bay, One Road, and South South Cooperation, with rich resources, superb location, and better development foundation and condition. South Africa, in my view, is among the first country to sign the Bear and Row, a Bear and Row MOU, as I know, with China. You was the first country signed the MOU with China. China has committed ourselves to work together with South Africa to become another Bear and Row pilot country in the continent as Ethiopia and Kenya, if you like, to achieve early and more visible and fruitful result for, four, for our two peoples and to show the success to the rest of Africa and beyond. I'm fully confident of, for the bright prospect for China South Africa and for China Africa, Bear and Road Corporation to achieve win-win cooperation. Let us join hands together to build an even closer China African community with a shared future by jointly connecting the Bay and Row with this continent to bring happiness and a better life to all of our people. I thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I think it was a very good uh, setting of the scene uh, and preparing us uh, for the discussions uh, that will follow. Let me now also sort of formally uh, welcome uh, uh, Honorable uh, Cedric uh, Frolic, who I think needs no introduction. And I'd also like to ask you to come and join us up here on the, on, on the stage. And you can... Oh yes, you've got Adam's. Uh, Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Great, thanks. Um, so I'll ask uh, now the Honourable uh, Cedric Frolic to come up to the stage, and then after that we'll move to to Ambassador Gengi and, and Professor Shelton, and then hopefully an opportunity for us to uh, take a few questions uh, from the floor. Honourable Frolic. Program Director. The 
Vice-Chancellor of the University, Professor Abib, for his warm welcome. Your Excellency and friend, Ambassador Lin, Ambassador Genge from Durko, Professor Shelton. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to make an input in this very important discussion. Ambassador Lin has reflected on the recent interaction between our two countries. And I want to amplify the importance of the visit of President Xi Jinping on 24th of July 2018 to South Africa. This visit also marked the celebration of 20 years of diplomatic relations between South Africa and China. And at the time, President Xi Jinping said, and I quote, our two countries have witnessed increasing political mutual trust, practical cooperation, people-to-people -people exchanges, and strategic coordination. We will then recall that immediately after that, the BRICS summit took place in Johannesburg, and President Cyril Ramaphosa then paid an official visit to China. This visit was followed by the FOCAC summit that took place in Beijing, where African leaders from across the continent applauded President Xi Jinping and his country's commitment towards cooperation with the continent and the benefits that the Belt and Road Initiative brings. Now, very often the criticism that is leveled against China is why all of a sudden now Africa, Ambassador, why are your interest in taking all these African leaders to Beijing for a summit? And we need to remind ourselves that in 1971 at the time, when China was not a member of the United Nations, the Chinese president then, Chairman Mao, said that he will never forget the role that Africa played in the readmission of China into the United Nations. And he said, and I quote, we were basically carried back into the United Nations with the support of our African brothers and sisters. So this relationship is then founded and it is grounded on that mutual understanding and respect that at the political level our relationship goes even further back before the readmission of China to the United Nations. At the time of the FOCAC summit, China indicated through President Xi Jinping the eight major initiatives that it will engage with African countries over the next three years and beyond, covering areas such as industrial promotion, infrastructure connectivity, trade facilitation, and green development, as well as the provision of new funding to the continent to the tune of 60 billion US dollars. At the same summit, due to the increasing attention that Africa is now getting, as well as the differences of opinion on the involvement of China in Africa and Africa's relationship with China, our president, President Ramaphosa, said that FOCAC, and FOCAC speaking on behalf of all the African countries, refutes the view that a new colonialism is taking hold in Africa, as our detractors would like us believe." Close quote. The question also then arises, at a government level, the relationship is sound, there's a very good cooperation taking place, but what is the interest of the South African Parliament? Parliament has a constitutionally mandated function and responsibility to represent the interests of the citizens, to make laws, to oversee executive action, and to hold the executive accountable for the implementation of their work. And finally, we process the budgets. We must approve all the agreements that take place between South Africa and different countries in the world. Since 2006, the South African Parliament established a formal exchange mechanism between ourselves and the National People's Congress in China. As a result, over the years, there's been a regular exchange and visits between members of parliament of both our countries. Committees that have visited China include trade and industry, international relations, tourism, communications, police, defense, arts and culture, and environmental affairs. And environmental affairs for us is of particular importance. 
The work of Parliament is to provide the legislative framework and the laws that will underpin our relationship in the Belt and Road Initiative, and to collaborate and work with other African countries through the Pan-African Parliament and the African Union with our colleagues in China. What is important, though, is, is that wherever development takes place, we need to ensure that we also collaborate and plan as far as economic development on the one side and the ecology and the environment on the other side. We appreciate what the senior Chinese official in the Ministry of Environmental Protection said very recently, and I want to quote him, we won't have this win-win relationship if the environment is neglected, and we have many lessons to learn in this regard. For us, then, it's important that we see the Belt and Road Initiative as an economic framework developed to increase connectivity between China and Africa, and specifically South Africa, as well as other partner countries. The aim is to link the different regions of the continent and China along the Belt and Road, and to see that we in Africa especially bridge the gap physically, financially, digitally, and socially with our compatriots. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we further see the Belt and Road Initiative as an opportunity to strengthen relations between China and Africa and to ensure that there are greater contact between our people. Because ultimately, it is people-to-people -people contact that will ensure the successful implementation of the Belt and Road Initiative. There is already a strong indication that many African countries are strategically situated or are being repositioned to benefit the most from the Belt and Road Initiative. In fact, China's social economic development over the last 10, 20 years, as articulated by Professor Habib earlier, indicates that this develop developmental trajectory can be used as a reference by other developing countries, especially on our continent, especially as the Build and Road Initiative is underpinned by the idea that countries should exchange experiences, discuss policy me measures, and jointly formulate strategic plans for long-term sustainable development and global governance. Thus, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, calls for the establishment of a China-African legislative collaboration for economic development as well as the environment. This will ensure that we focus on the specific provisions of climate change, water conservation, and desertification control and biodiversity protection in the FOCAC action plans that are there. That will ensure that we cannot adopt an attitude to say that, you know what, let's develop economically, but forget about the environment in which we operate. Let's put economic development at the forefront, but forget about the terrible impact that climate change will have on, and are currently already having, on the world. It will also ensure by working together in a sustainable way between China, African countries, and other countries along the Belt and Road, that we reaffirm our commitment to multilateralism and move away from a right-wing approach where we say we unilaterally decide this is what we will do because it's in the best interest of our countries. We further support the idea that people-to-people -people exchanges while underpinning the Belt and Road Initiative will also create the platforms as we are seeing here today for further discussion and also clarifying any fake news ambassador that may be out there. And just to stop at that point, uh, my constituency is in the Eastern Cape in Port Elizabeth. And I was surprised about two weeks ago when I heard this news going around to say that 13 Chinese police stations have recently been opened in South Africa. Now, I was shocked because I attended the event that took place in Port Elizabeth. And what was happening there 
at a Chinese community center was in fact collaboration between the Chinese local community there, the municipality, the metro on the other hand, the province, across a range of issues, specifically also on the issue of safety and security. Because as we develop economically, we need to also take into account the threats that come. We also cannot, as President Ramaphosa recently said, we invite people into our house, and when they are in our house, they are being robbed, or they are being harmed. We cannot afford to do that. So we work on all different fronts together to ensure that we implement the already the bilateral agreements that are there between our countries. Ladies and gentlemen, the potential benefits of working together as legislators, as members of parliament, as the representatives of our people are immense. It will ensure that what leaders decide at executive level is overseen by the representatives of the people to ensure that our mutual interests are protected. I'm therefore, in closing, uh, program director reminded by the remarks of our president at the conclusion of the FOCAC Beijing Summit, where he was given the opportunity on behalf of the summit to make the final declaration. And I quote what the president said. He said, our po political orientation and perspectives are very similar. We have a revolutionary approach and we look at the world in a similar way. We are therefore close friends. We have entered a golden age. Some are jealous and that's why they say it's a new colonialism, close quote. On behalf of parliament, I want to express our appreciation for the value of the mutual friendship, partnership, and respect of the people of China. China and its different provinces approach us and say, South Africa, you have gained experience in lawmaking, in legislative processes, specifically in the area that is being seen as the face, the new face of China. The provinces has come and said, we want to collaborate with you so that we can underpin our work by strong legislation, strong laws to ensure that what we agree upon is fully implemented. We commit ourselves, Your Excellency, to furthering, cementing and strengthening the close ties between the Parliament of the People of South Africa as well as the National People's Congress of China. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Frolic. Uh, I think a number of very concrete proposals, which uh, I think the, uh, the Ambassador w was making notes about, and I think also for us as an academic community, I think important uh, to reflect on not only the China-Africa legislative collaboration that already exists, but that can going forward also in the context of the Belt and Road. But I thought the points that you made about the environment and the fact that economic growth and development is not uh, doesn't have to happen without consideration for the environment. Sometimes we, uh, some of the debates that you, that you hear also in some developed countries is that you cannot have, you cannot worry about climate change and uh, have economic development. Doing that sort of makes you lose jobs and things like that. And I think the point that you've made is absolutely important. And I think in increasingly countries and provinces, and that's the other dimension, it's also uh, lower tiers of, 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 of government uh, that are part of not only the outreach and engagement with China, but also in taking action uh, around things like, um, like environmental sustainability, that these are now very much front and center of the way in which policy around economic development uh, is formulated and very importantly, uh, as Adam said earlier, uh, implemented. And there are lessons then and experiences that we can share from there. Right, let me then move on to, uh, uh, to Ambassador Manalisi Genge, uh, an old friend and, uh, and one who is uh, also uh, a long, uh, long time uh, expert uh, and practitioner in, in, in the Asian realm. So. Uh, 
Professor uh, Tse, let me acknowledge you and also allow me to acknowledge uh, uh, Ms. Bongiwe Tutu with a very beautiful introduction at the beginning of the session. Uh, Excellency Ambassador Lin Sontiang, uh, Honorable Cedric Florek was a co-chairperson uh, committee's parliament of South Africa, and he has been fully introduced. I know Professor Fen Dishang uh, of the International Business School, Beijing Foreign Studies University. Uh, dear friend, uh, Professor Garth uh, Calden, and it is nice to reconnect with you. Uh, the, the audience, uh, dear fellow, academics among the audience and of course let me uh, acknowledge in his absence in his absence uh, professor adam habib uh, who's a long uh, friend of mine uh, chair let me thank the university of of the Witwatersrand for hosting this important belt and road initiative conference this is an opportune time when Africa needs more investment in infrastructure and industrialization to reach its objectives as set out in the African Union's Agenda 2063, which, which now has become a developmental blueprint of our continent. The, the Agenda 2063 aims to support Africa's uh, integration and growth, technological transformation, trade and development. This conference in so many ways is a reflection of the extent of our cooperation as mutual friends as dictated by the spirit of the Silk Road, ancient and modern. As previous speakers have mentioned, the Belt and Road Initiative is an ambitious effort to improve regional cooperation and connectivity on a transcontinental scale with greater connectivity among Africa, Asia, and Europe, the Belt and Road Initiative aims to create shared development and prosperity informed by win-win in the regions which form part of this initiative. China has embarked on, a, on signing of MOUs on jointly building the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road with countries including those which not necessarily directly benefiting from the Belt and the Road Initiative. South Africa and China signed an MOU, as you have alluded to, Excellency, uh, signed an MOU on jointly building the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Road in December 2015 on the margins of the Johannesburg Fogak Summit. Following the Johannesburg uh, Fogak Summit, the Belt and Road uh, Summit was held in Beijing from the 4th to the 15th, sorry, from the 14th to the 15th of May 2017, attended by 29 leaders out of 65 countries that are part of the road, Belt and Road Initiative, with representatives over, uh, for over 100 countries, including South Africa and of course, as well as the 70 international organizations. The summit added another layer to China's commitment to globalization. According to the State Councillor and Minister of Foreign Affairs of the People's Republic of China, His Excellency, Mr. Wang Yi, who spoke at the United Nations in September this year, over 130 countries and international organizations have signed agreements on the Belt and Road cooperation with China. It is estimated that the total trade between China and the countries along the Belt and Road exceeded three trillion US dollars between 2014 and 2016. The, the 40 billion US dollar Silk Road Fund and the 100 US dollar billion Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank are used to support the initiative while the, Chinese, while the China Development Bank is set to invest over 890, 8, 890 billion US dollars into over 900 projects in 65 countries. The projects are aimed at building up much needed infrastructure, increased trade and finance, 
and boost connectivity across Asia, Africa, and Europe. This initiative made headway in 2017 in areas including capacity development, investment and Silk Road. The initiative is transforming the landscape in many ways and is, the, is in the early stages of a massive overall of the world's high-speed infrastructure. Global connectivity and networks are taking place, are taking place and these are underpinned by economic corridors featuring land, sea, and air, and transport routes with information technology and connectivity through large-scale rail corridors and uh, under construction. Over, over and above the development of in infrastructure and promotion of trade and connectivity, the Belt and Road Initiative could delve into areas that are at the core of the fourth industrial revolution. Referring to the subject of one of the themes of this conference, that is, how to connect the Belt and Road Initiative to Africa, including South Africa. Among the most appealing, appealing factors for Africa is China's repeated assertion from the outset that the Belt and Road Initiative will be developed within the framework of the five principles of peaceful coexistence, namely, mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, non-aggression, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit, and peaceful coexistence. The African Union's Agenda 2063, with the theme, The Africa We Want, is our initial reference point when defining Africa within the Belt and Road Initiative. The Agenda 2063 seven aspirations were launched at the African Union's 50th anniversary celebrations in Addis Ababa in May 2013. In terms of the plan, African leaders made a pledge to accelerate growth, development, and prosperity on the continent as it progresses to 2063. In this context, Africa's population of about 1.7 billion is still growing, with people distributed throughout the 55 AU member states, is indicative of Africa's current position as being poised for growth and development. Sub-Saharan Africa in particular is expected to reach a GDP of 29, billion, 29 trillion US dollars by 2050. However, further developments of our economies are hampered by a lack of industrial capacity, as well as massive infrastructure backlogs. I think Ambassador Lin has elaborated fairly well on this point. The Road and Belt Initiative could channel China's capacity in areas such as infrastructure development to Africa, a necessary component in, of industrialization, both the Forum on Africa, on China-Africa cooperation, that is FOCAC, and the Road and Belt Initiative recognize the importance of industrialization and development of infrastructure on the African continent as the, fu as the future driver of the gr global growth as articulated in Agenda 2063. The African Union has been driving the reindustrialization of the uh, continent's economy improved connectivity, including ICT, of course, and infrastructure technology transfer and skills development. The role of the Belt and Road Initiative to realize this end becomes imperative to Africa's development. The continent's role in the Belt and Road Initiative should be underpinned by the following critical areas. One is industrialization, two, infrastructure development, which includes ICT, development of special economic zones and the industrial parks, development, developing the energy sector, the ocean economy, development of finance area, and human resource and skills development. It should be noted that in May 2014, Premier Lee Kuing visited Africa with a view to further expand China-Africa cooperation, especially in 
in the infrastructure domain. On 27 January 2015, China and the African Union signed a memorandum of understanding to cooperate on the development of major infrastructure networks, improving connectivity, as well as industrialization on the African continent. According to the National Develop Development and Reform Commission, steady progress has been made in the building of major projects in Africa. For example, the examples that were already cited by Ambassador Lin, the, Ma Ma the Mat Madaraka Express, connecting the Kenyan port of Mombasa with Nairobi, and the concluded Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway. I must add, Excellency, that recently in South Africa, an event that maybe is un went unnoticed, the, the road between Mozambique and, and KwaZulu Natal. That, that, is, that has cut the, 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 the time I was told by five hours, time of traveling between these two countries in terms of uh, this initiative. Furthermore, the African Union has embarked on an ambitious program to tap the ocean and seas as a new horizon for development. Africa thus remains among the key global growth points of development in the 21st century. China has prioritized, prioritized interaction with Africa through FOCAC. Excellencies uh, and, and, uh, and uh, dear colleagues, in closing, it is clear listening to the presentations of, of my fellow speakers that the Belt and Road Initiative is paving the way for, towards inclusive development and growth, eliminating of poverty, uh, and, acts of, and acts in the interest of Africa's growth and development. And I must, I must uh, add here, I think what, what, what uh, uh, Professor Adam Abib said earlier is, is, a, is a very important point to note. All countries have interests, and all countries have agendas. Uh, and and, and the, uh, I, I don't see a point why we should uh, be debating the, the agenda of China as if China has a dominance on the agenda. The key, the important point is the countries must balance their interests with their partners, in this case with China. And China has to be engaged that its interests and the interests of the African continent should converge. To say China's interest, China is, is dominating, I think is a person who is not familiar with negotiating the agreements. Normally in the agreements, each country places its interests in a better position. And lastly, Excellency, we anticipate that a coordinated effort with a clear plan of action will define this conference as we urge towards realizing the final destination of a better and a more prosperous, prosperous life for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Genge. I think also very importantly for highlighting the, the broader continental agenda. And I think the areas of, 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 of possible convergence of, of interests, which uh, we are familiar with, uh, 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 with the Belt and Road. I mean, I think you highlighted industrialization, infrastructure development, special link economic zones. These are all important dimensions of Agenda 2063. And I wanted to come back to you, Ambassador. You mentioned uh, four platforms um, uh, for engagement. It was uh, FOCAC, uh, BRICS, um, BRI, and and South-South cooperation. I'd like to add another one which China has used uh, as a way of advancing some of these ideas, and that's, of course, the G20. And I'm reminded of, your, uh, of the Hangzhou uh, uh, summit and the declarations that came out of that around industrialization and low-income countries and, of course, also for Africa. So there are five platforms to match five connectivities. <laughs> Um, anyway, let me now call on uh, Professor Garth Shelton, uh, a long-standing member of uh, the faculty at WITS and specifically the Department of International Relations. And uh, we go back a long time <laughs> on these issues. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Madam Chair, Your Excellency. Uh, thanks very much for invitation to be with you today. I visit China as often as possible three or four times a year if I can. Uh, so China is my second home. So I'm very happy to be with you and I'd love to share with you my experience with China as well. 
So I'll just say um, good morning to all comrades and friends, and that includes everyone. <laughs> um, I've actually stood on the Silk Road, according to my tour guide. Uh, I don't, I'm not wearing the same shoes, and I didn't take a photograph at the Silk Road, but I've been there. It's not that wide, actually, where I stood. They said it's wide enough for four camels, apparently, to pass through. And on the other side was uh, the desert, so we didn't venture along the Silk Road. But I'm happy to say that we now have a new Silk Road, a wonderful opportunity to develop through technology cooperation. So in preparing for this presentation, I thought we should ask three questions. As I do with my students, I teach on East Asia, specifically China, at Wits University. So I set myself three questions. I'll try to answer them. Um, if you disagree with me, you're most welcome, of course. Um, sometimes my students disagree, and sometimes they agree. That's a wonderful opportunity for debate. So my first question is, which country is Africa or South Africa's best development partner, and why? So which is our best development partner? I'm going to argue that China is Africa and South Africa's best development partner, and I'm going to give you six reasons why I think that. Just as a footnote, I know a lot of scholars complain when we just lump Africa together as one sort of unit. Uh, I know, I understand there are many African countries with many different ideas and cultures and languages, but I think we all face the same problems, the same challenges, poverty, inequality, and the need for development. And I think that's why we just stick them together for convenience. Second question, how can the Belt and Road Initiative assist Africa? I think there are many ways the BRI can assist Africa. I'll give you five reasons why I think the BRI is ideal, it's perfect for Africa at this time in our development. How should we proceed, or what are some suggestions for the way forward? My Vice Chancellor, I think, uh, kind of raised this issue. Where do we go from here? So I'd like to take up on that point. I'm gonna suggest five suggestions, give you five suggestions on how we should proceed the way forward. So in summary, my presentation is six plus five plus five. Please don't miss any of the comments that I included. Sorry, this is <laughs> I tell my students that prepare for the exam, don't miss any of them. Eh? Common interests, we've talked a bit about common interests, some of the other speakers. Uh, six reasons why China is Africa's best development partner. Firstly, I think we share a common history of struggle against imperialism and neocolonialism. Uh, the history of cooperation and solidarity. So if you think, if you look at the history of China and Africa, we are true partners going back for many years. And that is a very solid foundation on which to build cooperation. My second point, I think both uh, China and Africa today face very similar challenges. The same challenges I mentioned in the context of Africa poverty, inequality, development. China's done extremely well, I think, in overcoming those challenges. In my visits to China over the last 20 or so years, I've seen the changes. Changes are enormous. Um, so we can see that there's been enormous success in this context of China. China creates approximately 10 to 20, sorry, 10 to 12 million new jobs every year. Uh, if we could do the same in Africa, I think we'd be in a very strong position. And as we know, China has lifted approximately 800 million people out of poverty. So we need to catch up with China. But we're certainly doing the same things in Africa. We have the same agenda. Number three, I think both Africa and China share a common vision for a new multilateral global order. I think we are moving towards that order. And I think we, we are looking for a global order based on equality, respect, and cooperation. So I think that's an area in which we can certainly work together. Number four, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, known as FOCAC, provides, I would argue, a unique mechanism for the development of the China-Africa partnership. I think it's a model for South-South cooperation, and there's been remarkable positive progress through FOCAC over the last 10 or 15 years. So we have the institutional structure in place. It's a matter of expanding that structure to include BRI issues, etc. 
Fifth point, which I always raise with my students, is that China saves a lot of money. Consumers in China don't spend all their money like we do on Black Friday in South Africa. They actually save 20 to 30 percent of their monthly income. So China has a lot of reserves, financial reserves, which they can use to promote development. So I think this is a wonderful gift to Africa at this time of our history, where we can draw upon our, our friends in China to help finance our development. It's a unique time in history for Africa. We can actually benefit enormously from the savings that have taken place in China over the last 40 years. Um, in terms of the FOCAC process, um, an amount of 60 billion US dollars been allocated for assistance to Africa through FOCAC. The Belt and Road, the latest figures I've seen, we're talking about 1.3 trillion US dollars. It's potential budget for Belt and Road. So Belt and Road is a really massive, world-changing project. We need to be part of that, for sure. My last point on why I think China is our best development partner. China's developed, has built massive infrastructure in their own country. Roads, railway lines, high-speed train links, etc. Fastest trains in the world are in China. This is exactly what we need in Africa. Those construction companies that have built China over the last 30 years should be welcome to Africa to do the same for our continent. China has the expertise, the knowledge, the experience to do that in Africa. So we should be very um, help welcoming. We should be very positive about this potential. My second key question, how can the Belt and Road assist Africa? And I think there's a sub-question here. Should South Africa join the Belt and Road? And I think we should join the Belt and Road as soon as possible. Transfer that MOU we've signed into action by Monday, if possible. We have the weekend to plan. <laughs> so if we can transform the MOU into action as soon as possible, that would be my feeling on this issue. First reason I think Belt and Road is, uh, is important for Africa. The Belt and Road is the next phase of globalization. Globalization, I would argue, is a very positive process. Of course, there's criticisms of globalization, labor exploitation, etc. But today, prosperity across the world is the greatest it's ever been. We're more prosperous today than ever before. And that is, I think, partly because of globalization. So globalization plays a very important role in uplifting the whole of humanity. And of course, the more we globalize, the more interdependent we become, the less chance of conflict in the international system, the more chance of greater prosperity. So globalization, I would argue, is positive. BRI is part of that globalization process. Second point on this question. I always mention to my students, and Ambassador Lin has pointed out this morning, East Africa is already part of the Belt and Road. There's enormous um, growth in that region now. There's railway lines, new roads, new prospects, and Ethiopia, Kenya, etc., are benefiting already from the Belt and Road. Many people have said that East Africa is the head of the dragon. We are hoping the dragon will grow throughout the rest of Africa. So actually, South Africa needs to catch up with, East, with what's happening in East Africa. The SADC region needs to catch up with what's happening in East Africa. And if we want to see the success of the Belt and Road, as my Vice Chancellor said earlier, we should investigate, we should research, we should go to East Africa and witness, do the research, and we'll see the success of the Belt and Road in East Africa and bring that success to the SADC region. Number three on my list in this context is if China is becoming the biggest consumer market in the world. China used to be the, is already the biggest manufacturer in the world. They will soon become the biggest consumer market in the world. The wealth of the middle class in China is growing every day. This is a magnificent opportunity for us to export more to China, not just raw materials, but other products. So this is an opportunity which is waiting for us in Africa. Belt and Road will help us to connect with the biggest and richest market in the world. How can we ignore that opportunity? Number four, many scholars have argued that the Belt and Road will promote global growth throughout the world, not just in Asia or in China, 
global growth throughout the world for the next 100 years. This is the, the wave of the future, so to speak. Belt and Road is something that will change the world. It's already changing many parts of the world. So we need to be part of this. This is something we cannot ignore. We have to find our space within that process and integrate as soon as possible. And I would, my last point, point number five on this question, I would suggest that full participation in the Belt and Road will help Africa to achieve its Agenda 2063. As Ambassador Genge has pointed out, our dream, the dream, Africa's dream is Agenda 2063 clearly articulated for the African Union. Synergy between that document and Belt and Road, I think is the way forward. We find linkages, find ways to work together in that context. China has the China dream, and they're well on their way to achieving their dream. We in Africa also have a dream. It's our agenda 2063. I would argue Belt and Road can help us to achieve that dream. We just have to find the way to implement it. So what about the way forward? What do we do now? I've suggested this Belt and Road is a very positive process. We shouldn't ignore it. Let me make five suggestions for the way forward. First suggestion, maybe we should transform FOCAC, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, into something new, into perhaps the Africa-China Belt and Road Forum. Move away from just China-Africa Cooperation to incorporating Africa and China in the context of the Belt and Road. And we refocus Africa's attention and China's attention on the Belt and Road in the context of Africa. And notice I've called it the Africa-China Belt and Road Forum, instead of the China-Africa Belt, Africa Forum. We've had the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation for the last 10 or 15 years. Let's make it now the Africa-China Belt and Road Forum. Make it something different. And as I indicated earlier, there's massive financing available for participation in Belt and Road, so this seems to be the correct direction to move into. Second suggestion, we, we need to urgently, in Africa, strengthen our plans for infrastructure building, roads, railway lines, etc. We need to provide the feasibility studies. We need to buy, provide bankable plans so that the Belt and Road can begin its work in Africa. We, we need to work harder, I would argue, in Africa to connect with the Belt and Road. Chinese construction companies I know are ready. Finance is available. As soon as we have our plans in order, construction can begin. We can begin to build prosperity on our continent. My third suggestion is that South Africa should urgently propose three or four major projects for Belt and Road funding. Um, we should prioritize this as part of our foreign policy, I would argue. And this should be our, our plan, our way forward. Three, very, three or four very important projects. We could focus on green economy, blue oceans, agri-processing, et cetera, um, infrastructure building, roads, railway lines, to connect us with the Belt and Road without delay. I think we are going to miss the boat if we don't move fast. My fourth suggestion is to, to offer Durban as our link to the Belt and Road. Um, Durban, I think, is a fairly advanced harbor. It's one of the biggest in Africa. Durban can become the Hong Kong or the Singapore of the Southern African region. So our maritime link with the Belt and Road, I'm suggesting Durban is our best option. And Durban can lead the way in connecting with the Belt and Road. So I don't have any interest in Durban financially or otherwise. Just, <laughs> just looks good to me. <laughs> Because <laughs> the Belt and Road is now linking with East Africa. We just have to extend it a little bit further to Durban. And maybe, as my Vice Chancellor said earlier, we'll all become billionaires if that's possible. <laughs> fifth, my fifth and last suggestion then, as um, I think my Vice Chancellor was hinting at, we should establish a Belt and Road think tank in Africa or South Africa in which we can generate new ideas about how the Belt and Road could be applied in the African context. In South Africa, we have a BRICS think tank, which generates a lot of new ideas on how BRICS can develop into the future. So now I think it's time for a Belt and Road think tank, or a Belt and Road seminar, at least, amongst South Africans, in which we can promote new ideas. And in which we can do, as my Vice Chancellor suggested, empirical investigation, 
We can look at the other Belt and Road projects in East Africa, other parts of the world, and bring that knowledge to South Africa to support our political leaders. We have to make these decisions at the end of the day. So I think a Belt and Road think tank would promote this process. I think it's urgently needed. In closing, Madam Chair, i make a few concluding points. Um, during the 1980s and 1990s, there's a lot of debate about uh, globalization. Is globalization good or bad, etc. I think the debate falls on the side that it's a very positive process. Uh, there's an eminent sociologist by the name of Professor Elizabeth King. She suggested that globalization brings the people of the world together, incorporated into a single peaceful world society. And I think for me that's what Belt and Road is doing. It's bringing us together in one society where we're interlinked, promotes cooperation, reduces the possibility of conflict. So globalization in that context is very positive. And then of course I think uh, President Xi Jinping, the President of China, would agree with uh, Professor King's comments. Because President Xi Jinping has spoken about the concept of we all sail together in the same boat. Humanity is together, we're all in this together. We should find ways of working together, of connecting with each other and building this common prosperity. So my final comment then, Madam Chair, is we all sail in the same boat. Let South Africa and Africa get into that boat as soon as possible, otherwise we'll be left behind. Thank you very much. Right, great. Some, uh, some great uh, concrete suggestions uh, there too. I'm going to move speedily on to take one round of questions uh, uh, and then ask uh, uh, panelists to also make very brief responses so that I don't cut into your tea in any significant way, but I am going to cut into your tea a little bit by a few minutes. So there are roving mics. Right, uh, please introduce yourself uh, and uh, ask the question shortly and sharply. And I recognize the person here. And if you can indicate who the question is for, if, if, that's, if that's relevant. Hi, hi. Good morning, panel. Uh, I'm Keith Tabo. I'm the Vice President of Black Business Council. Of course, I was in Fokak. I'm part of Fokak. I was in Beijing. And I think President Xi was very clear on Fokak uh, focus because it, wa it, sh it should be distinguished from uh, Belt and Road Initiative because in my understanding, when he pre was presenting it, it was to focus specifically on Africa because of the challenges that are mainly in Africa made rather than challenges in Europe and other countries like Asia. I think it is very key that that focus should be a special position. And also the issue of the 60 billion, part of which he indicated that was 15 billion uh, grants. I think from our side, my members uh, from Black Business Council organizations, we have all have compiled bankable business plans. As you know that in South Africa, the, 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 the business, the banks don't want to see any black business uh, succeeding. And also they have realized that China is a threat. In terms of agro-processing, we've packaged over 80 billion projects. I know some of the banks I want to mention, they rejected some of our members to finance their tractors on the condition that they don't partner with white farmers. So we have that situation in this country. So how quick can we implement? Because poverty in South Africa and Africa it is now, and we've got bankable projects which we can implement immediately. I happen to have a partner in uh, China, Skyworth, whom I'm doing as uh, one of the African broadcasters whom I, we are manufacturing in, in Runback. The partnership at the beginning, uh, uh, Ambassador, was okay for the first two years when you've got a partner, the Chinese partner, you get your money okay. But after two to three years, you, they begin to disrespect the laws. You can't even take them to court because uh, your contract is our Chinese Shenzhen. You have to take them to Hong Kong. And you know that in China, there's a lot of, you can't win in China if you have to take a Chinese company to court. So they, they, they are, that's why the, the there's some 
misunderstanding about the intention and the same purpose and win-win situation is questionable because it is sometimes we have got practical experience with China. Okay. I thank you. Thank you. Right. Are there, is there any other question? I can't see any hands. Over there. Okay. One, two, and I think we'll close it there. Good morning, panel. Uh, my name is King Pon. I'm a South African-born Chinese. I'm the chairman of the Shinda Friendship Association. Uh, Your Honourable Frolic, uh, I've got a question for you. Given the fact that South Africa s subscribes to the Belt and Road Initiative, what is the, the South African government doing to realize um, investments or, or giving opportunities for Chinese investors to come here? Bearing in mind, what is the policy with regards to business people wanting to invest in South Africa? Is there a policy? You're wanting investments. Investments can be forthcoming. What is the South African government doing about that? Thank you. Great, thanks. And if you can just pass the mic down to, to, your, to your right. Okay, good thanks. morning. Uh, my name is Saeed. I'm from Phoenix TV from China, Hong Kong. So my question, uh, we need to look at the challenge that's facing the, the Belt and Road Initiative which in my opinion, I think the trade war that is, is begun earlier this year between China and America, US. So uh, if we look at the long term between of the, of, the, of the Belt and Road Initiative, what is the significance of this initiative between China and Africa? Right. Thank you. Okay. So shall we ask the ambassador to address some of the questions, and then I'll move to you. Okay, thank you, Director. Uh, the first question, I think the, the plan uh, for China-African, China-South Africa cooperation, I think is ready, because the plan, the, the high-level dialogue it changes, I think is good enough. The plan, the must plan for our cooperation, I think is ready. Now the challenge to us is, we come here to see the partnership instead of ownership. We are not an owner. How far is it? We can go together, depend on you. When you are ready, we are ready. We like to work together with, you see, now we go to some country in the continent. I'm very happy to see this year with the very strong commitment and cooperation from China based on the, within the framework of focus, 16 countries in the continent. This year can win us more than 5% of annual growth rate this year. And some of the countries are more than that. So I think that is, for us, we are ready to, we're very sincere to work together with you, but to, for the world win cooperation is basically to fight against, I think in my view, that most number one challenge in the continent is poverty. But how can we work together to fight against poverty? Job, I agree with His Excellency President Lamaposa. His Excellency is right. Job is the key to fight against poverty. But job, if one family have one job, they can survive their family, they can they live in well. But how to get a job? In my views, job only come from two things. One is investor for production. No production, no job. Second, job only come from, or also come from visitors for tourism. But a visitor and investor, how can we attract them to come? You have to get ready yourself. When you're ready, when this country first, I think the, the environment must be safe, favorable, and policy must be attract attractive. And that is the way people, sometimes in China we say business is business. We government as a government to encourage them to come. Your government encourage them to come. But the, the environment here must get ready. So I think that is one of the questions. We are ready to come here to see the win-win cooperation, but how far we can go there, how quick, depend on the host depend on the owner. The last question I'd like to say, the trade war. Now it's here, the global trade war launched by American now is all, all over, the, the, because their policy, I think, is American first, American only, and no one survive or free from that war. No one can survive. But hopefully, 
The way is not only one country. The way is, we have to, whether they like it or not like it, we have to go together. We have to, to build a better world for us to work together. So now, this is the bare and low. is another option. Uh, we plan to get, we sit together. American, they are free to come to join us or not agree to join us. They are free. They like to close themselves. That is their sovereignty. But for us, we China benefit from the opening up to the outside world and suffer from the seclusion. So this is why my president said, China will never close, but we'll open wider. And now one bear one row, not only open, we like to build one bear row to reach each of the country who are interested to work together. Let us work together. Of course, one day, I, I'm sure, American will join us and work together to build a favorable world, a better world for us, that it we dream and we expect to have. The last question, I think, the, the, the friend, that is the question must come to the government. How the government get ready to attract the investor? <laughs> no, thank you, um, Ambassador. Um, I'm not representing the government. I'm not a member of government. I represent the parliament that oversees the government. However, um, I'm aware of a number of major investments that has taken place in South Africa, coming from China, collaborating with local companies here. Um, in the Eastern Cape Ambassador, when President Xi Jinping was here, he had the honor with President Ramaphosa to see the first vehicle that was assembled at the new bike factory in Port Elizabeth that rolled over the line. Similarly, you have FAW trucks that have also made a major investment in that part of the country. You have the expansion of the high sense facility in the Western Cape and Atlantis that is taking place. However, I want to agree with Professor Shelton to say that the three to four, I would even say five ambassador, major infrastructure projects and I know President Ramaphosa is a man of action. He's, he's an implementer. And talking to my colleagues and comrades in cabinet, I'm aware that there are discussions that are taking place around such infrastructure development projects. However, I do not have the authority to divulge particulars around that. The president, probably at a later stage, State of the Nation address or elsewhere, will further elaborate on such major infrastructure projects that will see clear collaboration between China and South Africa. But more importantly, we must not only focus on government to government interaction and development, economic development that must take place, but also in terms of the private sector. And there's a number of success stories there, but there is still a big room for improvement. Thank you. I'd like to add a few words. How significant of the one bear one row. I think it's very important. Whoever wants to sustain their economic development, whoever in the world, you need input for investment to, uh, to, to, to have the production, create a job and revenue. So you need the investment, but investment is based on, the production based on the sound infrastructure and the market mechanism is there. So the infrastructure is the key, the precondition and foundation. So you need the financial input. Whoever can help the infrastructure in the continent, I think that is the precondition there. That when you have the production, you need market. But I'm ha very happy to share with you that China, I agree with you, as in China, we already became the second largest economy with 400 million mid-income population. We are already, I'm sure we will be the largest consuming power in the world. In the in next 15 years, China is, is expected to import. Uh, 15 years, we are about to import 30 trillion US dollars of kind, plus 10 trillion, trillion US dollars of service. That is the market. And we are open, open wider to welcome you, I'm sure, in South Africa and in this continent. Whatever you grow, whatever you produce, the market is ready. And for the import, the investor, now, up to now, since 2014, China, every year we have overseas investment with the total amount of more than 100 billion US dollars 
for overseas investment every year. We have about 120 to 30 million personnel time to travel out of the country for tourism. And the tourism trade investor, I think that is, we are ready, we have. So whoever get ready, like to work with us to open each other, the market is ready to serve. Thank you. Uh, just one. <coughs> just on the, on the question of what is government doing. Uh, government is, is working, is preparing the groundwork for investments. One of the areas that we are busy with is the visa facilitation. In fact, now with China, we have entered into what is called visa simplification, which is about making it easier for us to attract the tourists from, from China. And secondly, the, the, in our department, Department of, of Trade and Industry, the DTI, DTI is developing what we call one-stop shop. Yes, it has challenges, one would have agree on that, but it's something that we are, we, are, we are working on to make it easy for investors to come and invest in our country. You will recall, uh, uh, dear, dear colleagues here, that uh, our president recently launched the job summit which was followed by the investment summit. At the investment summit, the, the president uh, unveiled the investment book, which the Department of Trade and Industry is responsible for. Uh, and, and the last point I just on, on, on South Africa-China relations. China is number one, is the top trading partner of South Africa. There's a lot of, 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 of uh, investments, business connections that are taking place between us and China. On the black, black, uh, black business council, which I had the opportunity in my other life to work with them on other projects than this one. I, I think, I think th what is critically important is for, is for the council to know the requirements, the criteria to qualify to have a bankable project. I think on that one, business to business, uh, if the projects are bankable and business to business, I think we can have a discussion with China. And of course, some projects, uh, even if they are falling within FOCAC, they need government uh, support. They must be backed up by the government positions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, all very much. Thank you to the audience for being attentive and for asking some, some good uh, and I think very relevant questions. I think it sets the scene for the next session. Um, uh, I see we're uh, sitting at about 11.20 or so. I think let's convene, let's try to take a break for 15 minutes of tea and coffee and health break and all of that and then let's come back here to start at about 25 to 12 if that's possible. Thank you. Thank you to the ambassador to the Honourable Frolic, to the Ambassador and Professor Shelton.